um, open at that page. That would be really helpful if you've got it there, and then you can uh, refer to it as I go along. I'm going to speak about it, and you can check that what I'm saying is really there. And I'm going to talk on this title, Can Christianity Really Meet My Needs? Can Christianity Really make, Meet My Needs? Can faith in Jesus Christ really make a difference to the things that matter to you? <clears throat> and to me, I wonder what you would say your real needs are. <clears throat> Some might say to be satisfied, to be fulfilled, to be content with life. Some people might say, well, it's to have a, a purpose and a direction in life and feel that I'm doing something worthwhile and something that matters and counts. Or to be loved, to be accepted, to be understood. In July 2015, a magazine called Reform asked 10 charities, what are the greatest needs that people have in the world. One charity said working together, another said hearing the voices of hungry people on our doorstep, another said climate change, others sort of talked about uh, sanitation and water, medical treatment, freedom for refugees, overcoming the fear of difference, child neglect, freedom, injustice, the list goes on and on. And all of these charities were Christian charities doing great work to make a difference to those needs. Christians care about the needs of the world and do something about it as well. Uh, Jesus taught us to pray uh, as we prayed a moment ago, give us this day our daily bread. Our needs matter. All of our needs matter. But the story is often told of somebody standing by a river and they see that somebody is in the water and drowning and so they go in and they pull the person out of the water to save their life. And then they see another person floating past and then another and then another and they start to think well maybe it's not just this one person that needs help maybe something is happening further upstream and I need to go and find out what that is and help with that and in the bible reading we had today Jesus is looking at humanity and looking at our needs and going upstream and saying where are all these needs coming from what is the real cause what is the underlying problem what is the real need that we all have behind every other need. And he shows that he knows what we need and that he is the one who can meet that need. Well, let's explore this a little more. Let's have a look at this story from Mark's account of Jesus. Well, the story comes in three parts, and let's look at what we can learn from each part. The first part is telling us Jesus sees what we really need. That's Mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 5, the first little paragraph in the Bible reading. Jesus sees what we really need. Let me read it again, those first few sentences from chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. That's what Jesus is busy doing, preaching the word, telling people his message. That has been his top priority so far in this account. He, he believes he's got some fantastic news that everybody needs to hear. News about how he meets those greatest needs that we have. How to be forgiven. How to be right with God. How to be made clean on the inside as well as the outside. How to be part of his new kingdom, his new community of believers who uh, have to learn to love God and love one another and looking forward to being with God forever. And Jesus wants to show how good that is, what good news that is. But again and again, people come to him for something else. They come to him for a quick fix. They come to him for help with their immediate needs, with their short-term needs. And that makes Jesus really busy. He's traveling around talking and preaching, but wherever he goes, people come to get help. And he's compassionate, he cares, and so he always helps people. He heals every sickness and every disease. He helps outcasts back into society. He drives evil out of people's lives, one person at a time. He feeds the hungry. He cares about the marginalized and he says, look, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And this is what it, it will be like more and more. So come to me 
and join that kingdom. He's been traveling around, uh, telling people, and now he's back where it all started, back at his home uh, in a friend's house. Now, the last time he was back in this town, living with his friend, um, a whole load of people, the whole town came to his door all in one evening, and he helped them with all of their needs and fixed all of their problems. And now he's back again. The whole thing is happening again. They're overflowing. Jesus is there trying to give a talk in this house, and the house is packed full of people. They're out on the streets as well. The doorway is, is blocked, and no one can get through it. But one group of friends are desperate to see Jesus. Verse 3. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four, four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Their friend is paralyzed. He can't walk. It's so bad he has to be carried by four people working together. They didn't, didn't have hospitals. They didn't have wheelchairs. Who knows what his life was like. This is his one chance to have something like a normal life, and they are determined to get to Jesus. They stop at, at nothing. They can't get in through the door, too many people, so they, they climb up at the fire escape on the outside, they go onto the, the flat roof, and they start digging a hole to try and get in. And there is Jesus trying to keep the attention of the people listening to him, but they've got dust sort of falling on them, and they're all sort of looking up and staring up, and there's this whole kind of opening in the ceiling, four faces looking down on them, and then down comes a mat with some poor guy sort of hanging onto it, trying not to fall off, uh, and uh, hanging down on ropes, and then a thud, and there is the paralyzed man in front of Jesus. And Jesus sees this man who, who is full of need and desperate for help, and I wonder what you think he says at that point. What do you think he does in that moment? I, I asked a group of children this. I told a group of children this story, and I asked them, what do you think happens next in the story? What do you think Jesus says? What do you think he does? And they all kind of put their hands up. They all wanted to, to guess. They all thought they knew the answer. Um, and they said, um, Jesus says to the man, you're healed. And the man gets up and walks away. That's what everyone is expecting to happen in this story. But Jesus does what no one expects. He doesn't heal the man. Not yet, anyway. Instead, he says something that is very surprising, shocking even. He sees a desperate and obvious need right in front of him, and he ignores that. And he says instead, chapter 2, verse 5, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, why would Jesus say that? Does Jesus think, is Jesus saying that sick people must have done something really bad to deserve what has happened to them? No, not at all. We know that's not what Jesus believed. He made that very clear uh, in, in other situations that he was in. You could look that up later in, John, uh, in John's account, chapter 9, or in Luke's account, chapter 13. That's not what he means. But Jesus has been trying to say, for some time now, wherever he goes... He's been trying to say that we have real needs that are much deeper than the needs you see on the surface. He doesn't just want to fix our bodies or our lives just for a short time until we get in trouble again uh, or get sick again and then die. He wants to save us and rescue us forever, for this life and the next life. He wants to restore our relationship with God and make us whole and right and start on the inside until that works out into our whole lives. It starts with forgiveness from God. My, life, my, my, uh, my wife loves to watch hospital dramas. I'm not really into hospital dramas. Sometimes I will watch them uh, with her um, and I'm sort of wishing there were more uh, more aliens, more superheroes, uh, a few more explosions. But she has this kind of really strange interest in shows that have things like character development and plot and <laughs> acting skills, and I just can't see why anyone would, would want any of that in a, a movie or a TV show. Um, but when I do watch the hospital drama, what I, what I realize is that often the, the big story is about 
what's really wrong with this patient? So everyone is, they've got all these symptoms, everyone's trying to treat the symptoms, uh, and the more they treat them, the worse and worse they get, and you think any moment this patient is going to die, they've nearly died several times, and they've just been brought back to life somehow. Uh, what could it be that's wrong with them? And then, then there'll be a, a particular nurse or doctor and someone really smart, and they'll, they'll get it, they'll realise it, they'll find out what it is that is wrong, and the patient will be cured. Well, Jesus is our spiritual doctor, and he sees what no one else can see, and he doesn't just look at what is on the outside and on the surface, he looks into our souls and into our hearts, and he tells us what is really wrong, and it's not what we think. Usually we say, if only someone would fix my circumstances around me, if only people, someone would change what is happening to me. My health, my, my income, my family, my work. We blame life. Or we blame others. And Jesus looks deep into my soul and tells me that my biggest problem in my life is me. And your biggest problem in your life is you. And he doesn't say that in a harsh, unkind way. He speaks to this man lying in front of him in a gentle, loving way. He says, my son, your sins are forgiven. He speaks to us and says, let me deal with this problem because I can and I will. A personal way, an intimate way. Let me, Jesus, declare you forgiven. All of your sins, everything you ever said and did that God heard and saw, washed away and forgiven. Jesus sees what we really need. And then the second part of this little story, the next paragraph, is telling us not only that Jesus sees what we really need, which is to be forgiven and right with God, but Jesus says he is really God, verses 6 and 7. He says he's really God. Jesus claims to be the God who made the world and who rules everything. Has, but he, he claims to be that God who stepped into human history who became one of us to show himself to us. Chapter 2, verse 6 says this. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The religious leaders happen to be there. They're listening to Jesus as he preaches. They see the paralyzed man come down. They hear what Jesus says to the man on the floor, and they are shocked they're, they're offended. They're outraged by it. They say, well, no one can forgive sins. I mean, these people are teachers of the law, the law of the Bible. They're kind of experts in this. And they know that it is not okay for anyone to go around saying that they forgive sins. Because in the Bible, and everyone in, in, in those days, in that place, they, they knew their Old Testament. They knew that only God can forgive sins. So, so for them, this is blasphemy. Jesus talking as if he is God. So imagine this morning the musicians got into uh, an argument um, uh, and uh, let's say Ian was, uh, was thinking, oh, I'd really like to play this in G and Caroline was thinking, oh, I'd really like to sing it in C and the argument kind of gets louder and louder uh, and then Caroline kind of goes uh, over to Ian and, and slaps him around the face. Now, Caroline would never do that. Uh, if you're sitting near her, please don't worry at all. She's a lovely person. She'd never do that. But just in, let's, hypothetically, let's imagine it. And then I come into the room, and I say, uh, Caroline, I forgive you. And Ian is thinking, well, what's it got to do with him? You know, I'm the one with the kind of red cheek and the sore face. Um, how, can, how can he walk around claiming to forgive people? I couldn't, could I? No one can do that. And yet, if there is a God, if God is real, then everything we do wrong is done against him, because he made us. He decides what is good and what is bad. The things that are bad are bad because they don't please God. And so when we do wrong, we do it against him, and he is the one who has the right to forgive. Now, you and I might not have got that when we heard this story read out. We might not always realize when we read the Bible that Jesus is claiming to be God, to be divine. He does that again and again all through the accounts of his life, we don't always notice because we're reading a long time later and we don't understand things the way they did. But people at the time, they did understand what was going on. His family understood 
and they thought he was mad. His enemies understood and they thought he was bad. And his friends understood and they said that he was God. And those are your only options with Jesus. Either he's got to be mad, bad, or God. One thing you can't say about Jesus, you can't say, well, he was just a nice guy. He was just a religious teacher, a good moral teacher about how to live, a good example to follow in your life. He can't have been that because a person who is that would never go around claiming to be God and talking as if he were God. That would make him mad, bad, or God. But Jesus didn't just talk the talk. He backed it up, and he showed people who he was. He gave us reasons to believe. That's the last part of the story, the third part. <clears throat> Jesus sees what we really need, which is forgiveness and to be right with God. Jesus says that he's really God. And then thirdly, Jesus shows he can really rescue, and that's verses 8 to 12 in chapter 2. He proves that it's true that he really is the one who who saves us, who rescues us by forgiving our sin so that we have a new start, new life with God in this life and after we die. Chapter 2, verse 8 begins like this. Chapter 2, verse 8, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. Now, how did he know? They didn't speak out. They didn't say, oh, Jesus, this is blasphemy. They were just thinking it in their hearts, to themselves. And yet Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking. He saw the paralyzed man and he saw the sin hidden inside him. And he saw the religious leaders and he saw the unbelief hidden inside them. Jesus is not just another ordinary person. And then he says, look, I'll prove it to you. Verse 8 Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Jesus says, I want you to know. I want you to know. Let me show you, he says. Let me give you persuasive and convincing reasons to believe that I am who I claim to be and that I can do what I say I can do. Let me show you. He calls himself the Son of Man. Did you notice that? The Son of Man. The person predicted hundreds of years before by their prophets. You could look it up in Daniel chapter 7. He's saying, I'm the king of God's kingdom, an everlasting kingdom, an eternal kingdom that they had been waiting for, that Daniel spoke about. I'm that king. I have authority in God's kingdom. I'm the king of that kingdom. And I am the one who can forgive you and restore you and bring you back in to that relationship with God and that community with him. Chapter 2, verse 12. The paralyzed man got up took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. The world has never seen anything like Jesus, not before and not since. And everything he did was in full view of the public, witnessed by lots of people, um, written down in their lifetimes, This is just one of many miracles, of course, that Jesus did. He did a a lot more, and he said a lot more that convinces and persuades many people that he is who he said he he was. But above all, he's seen alive again after he died. So to make it as clear as he can to the world that he is the one who can give us life with God forever. News traveled around the world in a generation. It made an impact on the world that still carries on today. This morning, there are groups of people like this meeting to worship this Jesus Um, all around the world. The world has never seen anything like Jesus before or since. Now, if there is no God, then of course what I'm saying is very silly. How can a person rise from the dead and do miracles like this? It's just ridiculous and laughable if there is no God. But how do you know for sure that there is no God until you've looked at the evidence 
to see where it leads. Because if you're open, open-minded about it, and if there could be a God, then this is what you expect God to do. Surely you'd expect God to want to communicate with the people that he made. What better way to do that than to come into our world, to live as one of us, to take on our lives, to live among us, and communicate with us in that way. And if Jesus really is God in human form, then of course you're going to expect people to be saying, we've never seen anyone like him. You're going to expect him to show who he is and do things that only God could do and to do the impossible. Well, those who, uh, if there's no God, he must have been mad, bad, mad or bad. When people look at Jesus, they don't usually say that he's mad or bad. Even people who don't believe in God, even atheists today, admire Jesus and respect his, his teaching and his character and his way of life. You don't find people accusing Jesus of being mad or bad. Now, only other option is that he's God. Just one other thing I want us to notice from this story as I finish. Uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Just notice how that starts. It says, when Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith. The, the paralyzed man is forgiven because Jesus sees faith. He sees the faith of the, the paralyzed man and the friends that are with him. They could have gone home. They could have said, well, we can't. It's too difficult. It's too complicated. Where are we going to find a mat from? It's not, it's not really easy to carry you. But there's the people in the way. We can't get in. We can't, you know, that's criminal damage. You can't just break into people's houses from the roof like that. We'll, we're just, we just won't do this. But they are so sure that Jesus is able to help. Nothing will stop them getting to him and meeting with him. They put their faith and their trust in Jesus, that he is the one who can meet our needs. And I want to ask, will you consider doing that? Will you put your faith in Jesus in that way? Could it be that he is the one who really can help with whatever it is that preoccupies you, with whatever needs that absorb your mind and, and keep you troubled and thinking, could it be that Jesus is the one to come to to meet that deepest need of forgiveness and reconciliation with God. I'm going to ask us to pause just in, for a few moments, just quietly, so that each of us, if we want to, can reflect on this. We can ask ourselves, what is, is, is Jesus saying something to you? What, is, what could he be saying to you this morning? What does this mean for you? Let's just have a few moments of quiet for those who would like to reflect and, and ponder.